Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship at Good Shepherd on this wet Thursday night. We're continuing our readings from John chapter 6, Jesus' Bread of Life Discourse. This evening we're focusing on how believing in Jesus, eating the bread of life, is the pinnacle of spiritual wisdom. We begin this evening by singing the listed stanzas of beautiful Savior. God bless your worship. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We do not deserve the gracious blessings of God who gives us daily bread and gave himself for us as the bread of life. Therefore, we begin our service in humility and confess our sins. I see my heart's condition now, my heart's diverse affection. Why do I love the things you loathe? I'm torn in two directions, now prodigal, now Pharisee. O oh God, be merciful to me. Who else but you can help me? Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I tremble as I feel your hand, expecting retribution, yet hear no curse or reprimand, but grace and absolution. With you there is forgiveness, Lord. You speak the sweet, consoling word, and I am sure you love me.
Gracious Father, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Grant that Christ, the bread of life, may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this evening as we consider Spiritual wisdom comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city, Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, Come, eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. Be we'll join in the song of praise, the first song of Isaiah. <laughs>
Our epistle reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This will also serve as the basis for Pastor Hines' sermon this evening. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel acclamation is another verse from John chapter 6. Alleluia, alleluia. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Alleluia. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But there, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Please be seated. During the singing of the second stanza of today's hymn of the day, the children of the congregation may come forward for the children's message.
of kids tonight, but I think you want to hear the children's sermon anyway. You probably like that one better than the regular one, right? <laughs> you know, Good Shepherd is starting school this week. Some of our public schools are starting in just a couple weeks, and so we're going to gain wisdom, right? And so I brought a few books along with me. This is one that uh, first graders use to start to write words and put them all together. And we need that kind of wisdom, right? To read and to write and to think and to understand things. That kind of wisdom is pretty special. I also brought a math sheet that you can work on. Do your adding and subtracting. We need that kind of wisdom, right? To balance your checkbook, to pay your bills, right? To build things, you need to know measurements, you need to know how to add and subtract. Isn't it great that in our schools we learn this kind of wisdom? And then I brought a science textbook too. And social studies, science, we learn all about our world and the planets, we learn about the animals, we learn about the human body, we learn about all the wonderful things God has made. And just think of all the wisdom that God has given people to make microwave ovens and cars and cell phones and medical procedures. It's wonderful. So we're glad when our children go to school, they get all this wisdom, read and write, add and subtract, figure out this wonderful world in which we live. This wisdom is great, but it's limited. But we have another book here that gives the most important wisdom of all, the Bible, right? Because those books can kind of tell you how to live in this world. But those books can't tell you about God, can they? Not who the true God is. If you want to know the answers to the great questions of life, like, what happens to me when I die? What does God think of me? Do I have any value? What about my sins and my guilt? Can I do anything with that? You can't figure that out in math class, can you? You can't figure that out in spelling class. True wisdom comes from God. This answers the great questions of life. And that's why we treasure this book and the wisdom that God gives us above all. And then when we understand Jesus and we understand he's the source of every blessing, it puts all the other subjects into perspective too. Because God stands behind all the laws of science and he gave us our wisdom to be used to glorify him and to serve others. We're going to learn more about that wisdom in our sermon tonight Let's join in the next verse of our hymn. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, amen. Our devotion tonight is based on Paul's words in our epistle reading, which was read to you earlier. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, many people out there have a great deal more wisdom than I do. Up on the screen, I printed one of those difficult math mind puzzles that they like to put in magazines. See if you can figure this one out. You have a number starting with one, followed by many zeros, but you don't know how many. When 276 is subtracted from the number, the sum of the digits in the result is 373. How many digits are in the original number? Now, I could work on that puzzle for weeks and not come up with the answer. I just don't possess that kind of wisdom. 
Remember the wisdom those Apollo 13 astronauts displayed when their oxygen tanks exploded in their service module, making their life support systems fail? Oh, they had plenty of oxygen available, but they had way too much carbon dioxide in the air, and that could prove fatal. So they had to use all their wisdom, all their skills, all their ingenuity, and even some duct tape to survive and to return home safely. Human wisdom is able to design complex computer systems, build huge skyscrapers, and develop technologies that enrich our lives in so many ways. Truly, this wisdom is a wondrous gift from God. But we always have to remember that human wisdom, as great as it is, has its limitations. It has setbacks and drawbacks and shortcomings. Human wisdom can design an energy-efficient light bulb, it can enable a surgeon to perform life-saving medical techniques. But you know what a human wisdom can't do? Human wisdom can't know who the true God is or what he's like. And human wisdom cannot answer the great questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? Human wisdom is limited. And since the fall... Human wisdom has also been corrupted by sin. Natural knowledge tells all people that God exists, and our conscience offers some vague concept of accountability to God. But how do we make up for the bad things we've done? How can we gain God's favor, his acceptance, his blessings? How can we be certain where we're going to spend eternity? Human wisdom offers answers to these questions, but the answers are all wrong. And the Bible warns us, there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. You see, human wisdom insists in order to enjoy a right relationship with God, in order to receive his blessings in this life, you have to earn it. You have to work for it. You have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's all on you. This work-righteous philosophy is at the heart of all man-made religions. When I visited Nepal a couple years ago for Christian Aid and Relief, I saw some people crawling along the ground looking poor and pitiful. But we were told they didn't really want us to help them because they were working out their salvation. They were intentionally suffering in that way because they wanted to get some good karma. They wanted to get some good points with the gods because they thought that then when they returned in their next reincarnation, they would return to a better life. One of our missionaries described their outlook on life this way, good for good and bad for bad. The gods reward those who are good with earthly wealth, health, and success, and they punish the bad with all sorts of earthly problems. So if you want to gain the favor of the gods, if you want to get ahead in this life, you have to earn it. It's all on you. Muslims adopt this same work-righteous philosophy Muhammad Ali, who was a Muslim, he once put it this way. He said, Allah has this balance scale and he's weighing your life. If you do more good deeds than bad, you go to heaven. If you do more bad deeds than good, you go to hell. So you better be good because Allah's watching you. Even Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, adopts this work-righteous philosophy. Oh, they refer to Jesus as the Savior, but to them that simply means that He's an example who showed us if we follow his way, what we must do to earn our own salvation. One of their articles of faith teaches the gospel is called the plan of salvation. It is a system of rules by complying with which salvation may be obtained. And perhaps at times we too are tempted to adopt this work-righteous philosophy. If you tell your child, if you're a good boy in Sunday school, Jesus will love you, you're teaching your child that Jesus' love is conditional and it's based upon their performance. If you think that your worship attendance or your offering or your acts of service is going to somehow motivate God to grant you earthly health and wealth and happiness, then you're adopting a work-righteous outlook on life. If you figure, i got to do something to make God love me. 
I got to do something to make up for my sins. I have to act in a certain way to obtain his blessings. Then you're falling for the lie that earthly wisdom promotes. Yes, earthly wisdom insists. You have to rely on yourself to enjoy a right relationship with God, and that's why earthly wisdom always gets it wrong. But in the Bible, God reveals another kind of wisdom to us, godly wisdom. Godly wisdom takes the focus off of self and your performance and focuses instead on Christ and his performance as your substitute. First, through the law, he leads us to despair of ourselves and to confess our utter failure to live up to God's perfect standards. In fact, we have to admit that our performance, our sinful ways, have earned nothing more for us than God's anger and eternal punishment. And so like that penitent tax collector, we too have to humbly confess, God, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner but despairing of ourselves. We cling to Christ. And we cherish the good news which the Holy Spirit reveals to us in the gospel. This good news is a message which human wisdom could never figure out on its own. And it's a mystery which human wisdom can't begin to comprehend. In fact, the message of the cross appears to be foolishness to those who are perishing. In our devotion today, the Apostle Paul put it this way. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by the Spirit. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. I think that's the key phrase of this entire section that we would understand what God has freely given us. So many people regard religion to be all about rules, regulations, and rituals, what you have to do to get ahead. But the chief message of the Bible is actually all about what God has graciously done for us in Christ. It's the gift of God, not by works. God doesn't deal with us in terms of merit, thank goodness. God deals with us in terms of grace. Yes, in the gospel we come to know and understand and cherish what God has freely given us. Paul goes on in verse 13. This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities in Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You see, friends, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see and appreciate all the wondrous blessings that Jesus won for us on the cross. We come to cherish Jesus as the bread of life who nourishes our soul and completely satisfies our spiritual hunger. We come to know and trust in God as our dear Father, a God of free and faithful love, a God of grace who gives us good things that we don't deserve and have not earned, and a God of mercy who does not give us the punishment that we actually do deserve. How is this possible? Because God punished his own son, Jesus Christ, in our place. Jesus paid your fine for your sins on the cross. He served your time. He endured your curse. He suffered the penalty of hell, which we rightly had coming to us. And now because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice, we are completely forgiven. We're set free, and we're set right with God. In Christ alone, we now have peace and hope and certainty We don't have to wonder where we stand with God. We don't have to endlessly struggle to try and get ahead and win his favor. We already enjoy the certainty of God's favor and forgiveness in Christ. In him, we have a bright future, and we await a glorious eternity because when we leave this earth, we're going to see Jesus face to face in glory and know that we belong there. We know this 
We're certain of this because the Holy Spirit has lavished his love and blessings upon us in the gospel. Embracing this saving message makes us the wisest people in the entire world. Wiser than all those people out there who like to boast about their human wisdom and their earthly accomplishments. In fact, our little children are wiser than all the proud and haughty unbelievers out there because they can joyfully confess, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And friends, that's what makes our Christian schools in our Little Lambs Child Care Center so special as well. That's why we treasure our called workers being installed on Sunday. Mary Leiniger as our Little Lambs Child Care Director. Holly Miller as our Preschool 4 teacher. Melissa Linton as our first grade teacher. And Linda Hughes as an instructional teacher. Their ministry is precious and it's vital and it's life-changing because they're sharing godly wisdom with these precious lambs and with their families. This wisdom from God is what makes us wise for salvation and it thoroughly equips us for every good work. You know, as we celebrate these called workers this weekend, I would like to address the young people in our congregation today and your parents as well. Would you young people prayerfully consider studying for the public ministry of the gospel as your life's calling? Would you prayerfully consider serving as a pastor or a teacher or a staff minister? There's great need and great opportunities for more called workers to fill our pulpits and our classrooms and to expand God's kingdom work all over the world. It's a glorious calling in which you first embrace the gracious blessings of the cross yourself, and then you have the privilege of passing this godly wisdom, this precious treasure on to the people that God places into your life. Yes, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And this good news, it completely changes our whole outlook on life. It completely changes the way we think and act, our attitude, our priorities, our decision-making process, our whole outlook on life. Paul writes, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. You know, there's a lot of experts out there, a lot of media pundits, wise people telling us what to believe and what to think, what's right and what's wrong. But their answers are all based on worldly wisdom and the basic principles of this world, and so they get it all wrong. So often they're pointing us in the wrong direction, away from Christ and away from the truth of his word. Our wisdom, however, comes from God. And it's revealed to us in his holy word, the Bible. The Bible is not just a collection of human ideas and opinions and editorials. No, it's the verbally inspired word of God. And therefore, the Bible is the absolute authority for all we believe and teach. And so following God's word as a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, we can make wise and godly judgments about all things. We know how to hold on to the good and avoid every kind of evil. We can see through false teaching and reject it. And we do know the answers to the great questions of life. We know who we are. We are forgiven children of God washed spotlessly clean by the blood of Jesus. We know where we came from. God created this whole universe in six days by the power of his word, and he knit each one of us together personally in our mother's womb. Therefore, we praise him, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We know why we're here, not to serve self and indulge our sinful nature, but to glorify God and to use our gifts and our wisdom to serve others. And we know where we're going. We're on a spiritual journey, a close walk with Jesus, which will one day lead us to our heavenly home. We will live free with Jesus forever in paradise. This makes us grateful and joyful and hopeful and wise, the wisest, most blessed people in the entire world because our wisdom comes from on high. Christian friends, let us always treasure God's wisdom as our highest treasure read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. And through that word, learn to cherish Christ above all. Christ, the bread of life. 
Christ the source of truth and Christ the power and the wisdom of God for us. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we join our hearts in prayer. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that Jesus is the bread of life. Lift our eyes of faith so that our lives focus on your word and your kingdom. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Lead us to treasure godly wisdom above worldly wisdom. Help us to hold on to the good and avoid every kind of evil and false teaching. Lord, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
You may be seated for the closing hymn.